We're going to be reading from Colossians verses 15 through 17, chapter 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is the word of the Lord. Hi, Shelter Rock family. My name is Corey Johnson, one of the pastors here on staff. And it is a joy to be with you today. Today we continue our teaching series as we've been journeying through the book of Colossians. The subtitle for our series is Resting in the Supremacy of Christ. And today we begin to unfold what it means that Christ is supreme. And if that's the case, how do we rest in him? As a note, we'll be talking, uh, we'll be taking a slow walk through the book. And today we're at what some theologians deem as one of the most profound Christological aspects or verses in the book. Today, our primary verses will be from verse 15 to verse 17. If you recall last week, we saw a beautiful truth in verses 13 to 14. It says, For he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loved, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Now, if we are in this kingdom, we've watched enough movies to know that there must be a king. So there are a few questions that we would like to ask. Number one, who is this king? Number two, what is the scope of his domain? And number three, what is the extent of his power and reign? Observe that this king is God's son whom he loved. This shouldn't be foreign to us because in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we find these words being declared from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Other religions might have a different perspective on or views about who Jesus is, but scripture is very clear about the identity of Jesus. He is God's son. And as a son, he reigns supreme in the kingdom. As we examine our text today, we will try, we will see three things. Number one, Jesus is supreme over all things. Number two, Jesus is the source of all things. And number three, Jesus is the sustainer of all things. First, we look at Jesus is supreme over all things, and we see that in verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. I want us to spend a few moments talking about the supremacy of Jesus. When we think about the word supremacy, it has not always been used in a way that connotes anything good. Quite often, this word is used within the context of power dynamics in in political or social areas. And historically, this word has often been connected with groups who have agendas that have not always aligned with biblical truth. The word means uh, to be superior in all authority, power, and status. And in a culture like ours that values equality from the president to the poor, when we talk about supremacy, it's an affront to our democratic society. But that's not the case when we talk about a kingdom. In a kingdom, the king is supreme. He is the pinnacle of power, authority, and status. And in the kingdom, whatever the king says goes. And so who is this King Jesus and and what qualifies him to, to be supreme over all things? First, let's look at the text. Paul writes, the sun is the image of the invisible God. We are not sure if this idea uh, originated with with Paul, but many theologians believe that it was an early hymn. But irrespective of its origin, Paul masterfully packs in just a few words what it means that Jesus is supreme. And we get at this from two key words. Number one, the first word is image. In the Greek, the word image is icon. It's where we get our English word icon. It carries this idea of a a visual representation of something produced on a surface. 
And, and if you have a smartphone and if you have a camera, you are very familiar with the concept of an image. An image is a, is a representation of you in a moment of time. Note that even though you can print it on paper, even though you can hold it in your hand, even though you can store it on a device, and even though you can Photoshop it, that picture is really not you. It's just an abstraction of the real you. But what Paul is suggesting here is not that Jesus is an abstraction of the invisible God, but rather that Jesus is the full embodiment of God. The idea of the image of God or the Imago Dei first appeared in Genesis 1, 27, where God created mankind in his image and in his likeness. And even though Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, they did not possess the full image of God. And what Paul is asserting here is that Jesus is the second Adam and that he comes fully embodying God's image. In other words, Jesus has made concrete what was invisible. Later in John 1, verse 1, John would write that that, that which we, we, we've known from the beginning, that we've seen, which we've heard, which we've seen with our own eyes, and that we've looked at and touched with our hands, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. John is talking about Jesus. The second word that Paul uses is this idea of firstborn. This, I, this word firstborn is only used eight times in the New Testament, and it mostly refers to Jesus. Sometimes the language doesn't convey the, the breadth and the depth of what the word means, especially since uh, in a cultural context, uh, we, we don't live in, in Colossae. The concept of the firstborn was significant in many cultures and in the Israelite family structure. This uh, idea of the firstborn was associated with, with birthright. And if you recall uh, Esau and Jacob, you remember that uh, Esau sold his birthright for a cup of soup. And later on, he regretted as the blessing was given to Jacob. More significantly, though, is that the firstborn had exclusive rights to the family inheritance, be that the family possessions or in family position. And the idea that, that Paul is conveying here is not that Jesus was a created being or that he was born first. No, he's just saying that Jesus reigns supreme and he has rights to all of God's creation. You see, uh, if we want to understand who Jesus is, we must understand that he is the king of the land and he reigns supreme. You see, wherever Jesus went as king of the land, you will understand that he was always doing good. Wherever Jesus uh, entered in, and as you read the Gospels, you will see that over and over again, that whenever Jesus entered a space, the kingdom of God came. And when the kingdom of God came, there, there were people who were being set free. There were blinds who were receiving their sights. There were people who were lame that got their... their, 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 their were, that were able to walk. People who could not speak, they got their speech back. Why? Because the king came. Jesus is king and he reigns supreme over all things. And whenever he shows up, the kingdom of God advances and it is good news to those who are listening. Jesus is not only uh, just uh, the one who reigns supreme over all things, but we see here in verse 16 that he is the source of all things. It, it, Paul continues and he elaborates on the identity and the power and the rule of King Jesus. Here Paul, Paul notes that in verse 16, for in him all things were created. This is a profound statement, and it flies in the face of our pride when we think that we are the source of a lot of things that we create. I don't know about you, but, but when I was in corporate and I developed a report or built a database or ran a successful uh, marketing campaign or developed a presentation, there was a sense of pride that came with the idea that I did that. I put in the hours and I exerted the efforts and I spent all the energies and I imposed my will on a system or on a sheet of paper to bring into reality that which was in my mind. But in light of this truth that God is the creator, that Jesus is the creator of all things, it humbles me because I realize that indeed and in fact, I am not the creator of all things. Jesus is. And he is the one that is creating things through me. Jesus is the source of all things. And he has created all things through him and all things 
for himself. Now, as Paul continues to elaborate on the scope of the things that Jesus creates, uh, he, he talks about uh, four different domains or four different aspects of the things that God, uh, Jesus creates. And again, he's pulling language from Genesis uh, in the sense that in the beginning, God created. And as we examine the terms that Paul used, it's as though Paul uses extreme terms on, on both ends of a spectrum to make a point. Paul is employing a rhetorical device, device called merism. It's this idea that, that the author will use two comp- uh, contrasting terms to speak about the totality and the completeness of the idea. And we see this a lot in scripture. You'll hear scripture, you'll see scripture speak of light and darkness. You'll talk to, talks about heaven and earth. It's talking about the totality of everything in between. And here when Paul is speaking about heaven and earth, he's saying that, listen, God, Jesus is the one who has created all things and everything between the heavens and the earth. Not only that, but Paul talks about the the, the visible and the invisible, meaning that anything that you see can see with your visual perception, with your eyes. Jesus is the one created that created that. And not only that, but there are things that your eyes cannot perceive that he has also created. Paul also talks about this idea of thrones and powers and rulers and authority. And what Paul is is moving into is the domain of power and authority. He's talking about the the power dynamics that exist uh, in, in our culture and our society. Jesus is the one who created these things. And even though many of us, we have seen where political institutions and and even many institutions that we are familiar with have abused these powers, we understand that when Jesus created these things, that was not the original intent. The intent was always to bring about the the, the well-being and the welfare of those whose lives we are impacted. And for some of us, especially our younger generation, there's a, there's a mistrust and a sensitivity uh, as we've witnessed the abuse of, of power. And may I say, even, yes, even in our church. And there are some of us who might be tempted to turn away and dismiss the efficacy or the merits of these institutions. But before you do that, can we have a conversation? Jesus' intended purpose for these institutions, be it marriage or family or the church or even government, was never to exploit people. If you want to see the purpose of these institutions, just follow the way of the king. A special shout out to Stephen Benz because last week when he was in Westbury, he, he coined this phrase that the way of the kingdom follows the way of the king. As you get to know Jesus, you will see time and time again that Jesus uses his his power uh, to care for those who are in need. You will see time and time again that Jesus uses his power to protect the weak, to heal the sick, and to bring justice to those who are oppressed. And when an institution follows the way of the king, it becomes an avenue of God's grace to his people. When you look at marriage, for some of us in our younger generation, even though we've witnessed the pain and disappointments of a failed marriage, may it not turn you away from marriage, but may it inspire you to follow the way of Jesus so that when you get married, your marriage can reflect the way of the king to others. Be that in our families, as we're pondering families, yes, uh, you may have experienced a dysfunction and the changes uh, that of growing up in a, fang- in, in a family where power struggles between mom and dad, uh, you know, you, you were impacted by that and you were the collar- collateral damage of that. But may it not discourage you from starting a family yourself. However, I pray that that will inspire you to follow the way of a king and shape the next generation for his glory. For the church, many of us, we might be disappointed with the church, but may it not cause you to abandon her. But I pray that you will develop a righteous zeal that, that, that brings you to a place where you are like, I want to serve Jesus and I want to see the church reflect the way of a king in terms of how it loves and cares for his people. And I pray that you will be invited and, and step into those spaces. You see, Jesus is the source of all things. He's the one who creates all things. But finally, Jesus is the sustainer of all things. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. So far, we've answered two questions. Who is the king? He is the son of God, who reigns supreme over all things. Second, we've answered the question, what is the scope of his domain? 
all creation, not just tangible and the concrete, but the intangible and the abstract. And the final question is, what is the extent and power of his reign? Paul continues to write, he says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. In this verse, Paul recapitulates the idea from verse 15 in his expression that he's before all things. Again, indicating the the preeminence and the prominence of Jesus Christ. But as he closes this segment, he bookends the supremacy of Christ by noting that all things hold together in him. Here we have an expanded idea of Jesus' supremacy in that he's not only the source and the agent of creation, but he's the one who preserves and maintains it. We can appreciate this distinction between those who are the creative type and those who are the maintaining type. Every institution needs both. You see, the institutions need the creative type because those are the factory or or those are the engine of new ideas. And we need these new ideas to propel the institution forward. But at the same time, we also need those who are gifted um, in maintaining and improving existing platforms and concepts. And so even though one employee might be gifted in ideation, you have another employee who's gifted in maintaining the status quo, who are conservative in their approach. And this is important because the person who is gifted an idea might be jumped from one idea to the next and you're wondering, where is this person going? But it is a person who, who, who wants to maintain things that, that reigns in that person. In other words, they have a different attitude towards ideas. They have a different attitude towards uh, doing things. They want to keep things the way they are. They, they want to hold it together. They want to maintain it. Think of it this way. It's almost like a gardener, Right? A gardener is the one who plants, um, and, and he's excited about new growth, and he's exp- excited about new seasons. And even though he's excited about new growth and new seasons, he understands that, man, there's some things that he needs to do to maintain the, the, the soil and the ground. There, there's some things that he needs to do in order to make sure that this thing, this new thing grows up healthily. Number one, he has to water it, and he has to make sure that it has enough sunshine, and, he, he, and sometimes he has to even prune it. All in the hopes, all in the purpose, all in the goal of making sure that this thing grows up as beautiful and as strong as it can. Same thing for us. Quite often, uh, we, uh, we love to jump from one idea to the next. But the reality is sometimes we need to maintain where we are. And what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is not only the one who creates all things, but he's also the one who sustains all things. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, I feel overwhelmed by everything that I have to juggle. Man, I'm carrying so much, be it the work, be it the children, be it the schedule, be it the job. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm carrying so much and I feel overwhelmed. And some of us, we're living in this, what we call the sandwich generation, where you're not only taking care of your children, but you're also taking care of your parents. And if truth be told, if somebody were to to, to open up the doors and the windows of your heart and open it and look at it, man, they'd be wondering, why is it that you're not toppling over? Why is it that you're not falling apart? May I encourage you this morning that the same Jesus who is able to hold and sustain this world together the same Jesus is able to hold you together. doesn't matter how wide or how large are the burdens that you're carrying, the reality is Jesus can hold you together. In Psalm chapter uh, uh, 61, um, you know, David pens uh, this beautiful uh, passage of Scripture, and I want to read it to you this morning just as a source of encouragement. He says in Psalm 61, verse 1 to 3, says, Hear my cry, O Lord, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against my foe. Do you see what David is saying here? David is saying that in seasons when we feel overwhelmed, it it can feel as though our hearts are growing faint. But, but in those seasons, Jesus doesn't want us to run away from him. God doesn't want us to hide away from him. In fact, the invitation is extended for you to run to him. Let me say to you this morning that Jesus is not afraid of your emotions. 
He's not afraid of your anger. He's not afraid of your pain. He's not afraid of your disappointments. He's not afraid of any of those things. In fact, your emotions were given by God for you to respond to him. And what Jesus is saying here, the invitation that is being extended here is that when you are overwhelmed by everything that you're carrying, do not turn away from God. Turn to him in prayer because he's your refuge. He's your strength when you need it the most. If Jesus is able to hold all things together, he's able to hold you together. Today is Mother's Day. And mothers are keenly aware of this juggling act. And so may I extend hope to you this morning that you don't have to carry it all by yourself, that Jesus has the grace, he has the strength to supply you with what you need all for the asking. This morning, there are some of us um, who you're, you, you might be watching and you're like, man, what is this King Jesus thing? What is this kingdom thing and you're wondering how is it that you people you christians are able to uh, to live a life of of joy and happiness amid so many brokenness so amid so much hurt and pain and the reality is the reason why we're able to live that way is because we've put our hope and our trust and our faith in the king of kings the one who is supreme over all things the one who is the source of all things and the one who is the sustainer of all things and today if you have not put your hope today if you have not put your faith in this jesus the invitation is there for you as well one of the burdens that we've carried is this burden of sin and Jesus on the cross, he died to take all that burden away from you and from me. And the response of the heart is to turn to him in repentance and by faith. And so may I encourage you, may I challenge you today to turn to Jesus in your hour of need. Today, Jesus is supreme. He's supreme over all things. He's the creator of all things. And he's the sustainer of all things. And if he can sustain all things, he can sustain you as well. God bless you. See you next time.